Now, so far, when we've talked about real-time scheduling, we have really only considered uniprocessor scheduling because we haven't uh, gotten into the complexity of multiprocessor. Um, so now it's going to get hard because we have to do some math uh, and it's, it's going to be interesting though. So let's get into it. Um, in this section, we talk about things um, in two ways. There's a task. So a task is something that needs doing and a job is a specific instance of a task to run. So we have a periodic task and it happens every one second. Well, every one second, there is an instance of that task to run and we call that instance a job. So when you hear the, the words task and job, just keep in mind, uh, this is the distinction between them. Um, and when we deal with a multiprocessor system, we need to make a decision about whether tasks have dedicated CPUs or whether they can move between them as needed. Um, the first question is, is preemption permitted? Um, the second is, is job migration permitted? And the third is, is job parallelism permitted? Um, and preemption, I mean, we've talked about um, in the past and we said actually it turns out we need preemption if we want uh, to have sort of optimal outcomes. Um, so yes, uh, we should expect usually that preemption is permitted. Um, is job migration permitted? This is about whether a job is allowed to move from one CPU to another. Um, and uh, is job parallelism permitted? Like, can you have um, you know, more, than one, uh, more than one CPU dedicated to this job? So if we actually want um, to um, use the dedicated CPU approach, um, it means job migration is not permitted. Um, and that's okay, right? Um, dedicated CPUs are an option um, and you can even have manual assignment where you say, okay, task one always executes on CPU zero and task two always executes on CPU one. Um, and that actually makes it a lot more like the um, uniprocessor situation, right? Um, manual assignment makes it, you know, okay, we have uh, four CPUs in the system, but each of them has um, unrelated tasks uh, and uh, unrelated execution. So, uh, you know, as the saying goes, uh, you know, do you have five years of experience or one year of experience repeated five times? Um, and if we do choose this approach where everybody has a designated uh, CPU and there's no migration between them, it's effectively you have like four uniprocessor systems that share some things in common. So things that we know already um, are sufficient. Um, right, manual assignment is interesting, but um, not actually that interesting. So let's imagine we want to ask the computer to help. You want the computer to assign the tasks to processors, um, and this is, according to the literature, a variant uh, of the bin packing problem, which is known to be NP complete. Uh, and NP complete is just a fancy math way of saying that if you want to be sure that you have the globally optimal solution, you must try all possibilities to be sure about it. But it's possible to get an approximation within a polynomial time. Doing so in advance for an all periodic system is doable where you can actually come up with the uh, uh, optimal solution or at least uh, sufficiently close to optimal solution depending on how much effort you're willing to invest computationally. Um, but probably we don't. Right. Um, for a system that is all periodic, we don't need to do this approach at all because we can come up with something, you know, in a timeline. Um, and for a system that has sporadic and aperiodic tasks, it's just not practical to do all the math at one time to try to uh, choose what is the most optimal way to schedule everything. So we're just going to kind of have to um, do something less, um, less precise, but faster. Now, if there is no migration, it does mean that there is a possibility that tasks are failing to meet their deadlines on CPU X for a lack of CPU time, even when CPUs Y and Z have plenty of idle capacity. And that feels pretty frustrating, right? You know, it's, it's like um, you know, you're in the collector lanes of the highway and it's at a complete standstill, uh, but over there in the express lanes, you know, traffic is zooming along. Um, ask me how much time of my life I've spent on Highway 401 more than is probably healthy. Um, but that sort of thing is um, frustrating, right? Things are more interesting if migration is allowed because migration can alleviate the problem of computing resources being unused, right? We have this extra capacity um, and when we need it, we should use it. However, it makes it extremely difficult to predict whether we can guarantee all deadlines will be met. 
Now, a simple analysis uh, might say that there is no cost to migrating a task from one CPU to another. We know that's not true, right? Um, in, in a very simple approach, you just say, all right, yeah, it's, you know, it's free real estate. These things don't cost um, time or, or anything. But we know that's not the case because uh, we talked about caching already. Uh, and when a task moves CPU, the new CPU may have none of the relevant pages in its cache, resulting in more cache misses and slower execution, um, not only for this task, but also potentially for other tasks um, because you know, it increases contention for the bus uh, or um, you know, kicks pages out of cache that the CPU is going to use for a different task. So like, what do, what do we do? Do we allow migration or do we not? Okay, well, let's back up a step. Let's consider our options. So option one is global scheduling um, where all tasks go into one single queue and a scheduler assigns tasks to available CPUs. Um, there is potentially some overhead of managing the single queue, but migrations are allowed. The second option is referred to as partition scheduling, and that's what happens when tasks are statically assigned to a CPU and each CPU manages its own queue. Um, option one, um, we talk about in like a queuing model of like this is the bank queue model where there's one queue and you just go to the uh, available teller um, when you need or you know, the Service Ontario model, same thing, there's one single queue uh, and when you get to the front you just go to whichever agent is available uh, whereas option two looks more like the supermarket where there are uh, multiple checkout lanes and you should choose which one you want to go to. Uh, and if you choose correctly, you know, great. Uh, if you choose incorrectly, uh, things are slower. But okay, let's imagine then um, you know, we're, we're going to um, choose one of these options. Some research shows that um, this kind of approach may only allow 50% utilization of the system, right? Um, the paper introduces a third option, uh, and the third option is called semi-partitioned scheduling. And why, why semi-partitioned, maybe you ask? Right. Semi-partitioned scheduling is most tasks are fixed to a specific processor, but some are allowed to move, right? Um, it's, you know, half and half. Um, intuitively, this seems like it might work. Um, you know, most tasks are fixed to specific processors um, and it allows for some flexibility, but not too much, right? We can still make some predictions about the system, um, but you know, extra tasks sort of go wherever there's space and maybe that helps us to uh, fill in the gaps, but um, isn't so restrictive that we uh, have capacity unused, but also not so um, you know, anything goes that it's hard to make a prediction. Here's the problem. Um, none of these approaches are actually solutions that guarantee that we have optimal scheduling for a multi-core system, right? Um, optimal, once again, in the sense that uh, if it's possible to schedule it such that all tasks meet their deadlines, the algorithm finds a way. What we need is a different approach and like a radically different approach. So we're gonna talk about P-fairness. Uh, and it's called p-fairness because p in, in this case is for proportional. Uh, and the goal is to allocate CPU time in such a way that tasks make progress at steady rates. In a less nice way of phrasing it, tasks are forced to proceed at proportionate rates, <laughs> whether they want to or not. Um, so more formally, right, um, uh, an application can request time x sub i time units every y sub i time quanta. Um, and the system guarantees that over any t quanta, t greater than zero, that a continuously running uh, application receives between rounded down uh, xi divided by yi times t time uh, and rounded up xi divided by yi uh, times t quanta of service. In other words, time is divided up into little pieces uh, and each process gets a proportional share of the CPU time and importantly, is never more than one time slice away from the amount of time that it should receive. Uh, and that's what the math is trying to say here. It's never more than one time slice away from the uh, time that it should receive based on this proportional fair allocation. 
let's actually talk about it. Um, the scheduling algorithm is complicated in the paper, um, and I had to spend a fair amount of time sort of staring at it to come up with a less complex explanation of how it works. Um, but I think I've got it now. We have to define some terms um, to make it a little bit clearer. Uh, and then once we have good definitions of those terms, it's easier to explain sort of how does the algorithm work overall. So lag is used as a term here, no, not in terms of like um, how long it takes uh, data to travel over the network or how frustrating it is to have a video call, but lag is used to reflect the difference between allocated CPU time and the time that the task should have. Right, should have based on its uh, you know, proportion of the available time slices. So if lag is greater than zero, that means the task um, is behind and it hasn't had as much CPU time as it should have uh, in a completely fair system, which means we should be giving it more CPU time. If lag is less than zero, then the task has had more CPU time than it should have had. Again, you know, should is a little bit in quotation marks here. Um, and if that's the case, then we need to give it less CPU time in the future to try to bring it back in line to um, you know, meet other tasks so it's fair. Now, in the literature, um, a task is urgent if it has a lag above zero. Um, and then, um, right, it, it, the lag is greater than zero and the lag would exceed one full quantum, i.e. one time slice, if the task doesn't run in the next uh, in the next time slice, a task is and I hate this word, tnegru. It's urgent backwards. I wish it were something else, but that's what's in the literature, and we're stuck with it. Uh, and much like Monica, that's not even a word, and I'm mad about it. Um, but a task is this word. If its lag is negative um, and would remain negative even if the task does not run during the next time slice. Um, if a task doesn't meet either of these definitions, then we would just call it other. So again, uh, it's urgent if lag is greater than zero and the lag would exceed one full time slice uh, if it doesn't run in the next time slice. Uh, and a task is tenegru uh, if its lag is negative and would remain negative even if the task doesn't run during the next time slice. Uh, everything else is other. Okay. So the scheduling algorithm then consists of three parts. And I mean, really by three parts, I mean three rules. Um, but rule one, schedule all urgent tasks. Okay. Number two, do not schedule Tenegro tasks. Uh, and three, schedule other tasks in order of highest lag to lowest until capacity is filled. In short, to make sure that the lag for any task is always between negative one and positive one, the scheduler prioritizes the task with the highest lag to make sure that they don't go over one. Um, and it deliberately ignores tasks that are negative so that over time they will go back towards being one, right? Um, it deliberately ignores them. Um, and um, if it's possible to find an appropriate schedule so that all tasks sort of meet their deadlines, um, this actually probably will do it. Um, in fact, the algorithm will find it, um, and uh, probably is the wrong word to use there, it will absolutely find it. Um, so if it's possible to find the schedule, it is an optimal algorithm, um, but also noteworthy execution is fair in the sense that all tasks will continue to make progress at about the same rate, right? The, the system is trying really hard to like keep every task as close to zero as possible. So it is fair in the sense that you know, no task is getting starved uh, and no task is getting you know, too much CPU. So that's, that's what we like to see. Um, some analysis, right? Scheduling is um, tractable in this case because um, every, every task is broken down into small slices um, and each of those is a subtask and those subtasks execute on a CPU when it can before the deadline. Right. Um, so wasted space is limited, right? It avoids some of the complexity of like the bin packing problem because subtasks just go wherever. Um, there's limited wasted space. Part of what makes bin packing hard uh, is that you know, items are of different sizes, 
right? Like it, um, if you're you know, packing an Amazon box, right? And you know, so here's a pen and here's like a pad of paper and you know, here's a USB key and here's a mug. They're all different sizes. And then you know, trying to figure out how best to pack those into a box is hard. Uh, and even what size box, I mean, you know, the computer will tell you what box you need, but that's difficult. But if you're just like filling, um, I don't know, bags of sand, uh, you know, the kind that they use at construction sites to like weigh down the temporary fencing, yeah, sand is sand, right? You're not too worried about like how to optimally fill it. You just like throw the sand in the bag and you know, you throw in as much sand as fits um, and then you're ready to go, right? Ship the bag, you know, load it on the pallet. There's no reason to worry about it. And so splitting these tasks into these you know, much smaller subtask pieces effectively make it much easier to do and also makes it so you don't waste space uh, uh, or at least as little space is wasted as possible. Um, and the original paper shows that a PFAIR schedule is always periodic, which is part of what makes it suitable for a real-time system. Now, there exist a number of um, papers building on the PFAIR approach to address some of its shortcomings and adapt it to more scenarios. Um, there's lots of stuff we could talk about um, and we don't have time for it, but there is plenty of interesting research um, based around this idea. Um, one, one thing that uh, a lot of the research papers are trying to do is reduce the required computation time because it is a known drawback of the system um, that um, every time we have a time slice, we have to do a lot of computation um, such that we uh, figure out what is the lag of each of the associated uh, tasks and then schedule them accordingly. The math for that is a little bit painful, so it does require a little of computation um, and reclassifying all the projects, uh, all the processes is slightly annoying, but it is doable. Um, and so the question is, is it worth it? That's a good question. Is it worth it? I mean, I'm going to say yes. Um, you know, in the, uh, previous, uh, in the previous situations we've been talking about, so uh, potentially losing 50% of capacity um, just because we need to be sure that we can schedule everything uh, and uh, sort of throwing away half capacity just to make sure that we get everything in is, well, it's pretty wasteful, right? The PFAIR scheduling approach, yeah, some time is lost to overhead, but certainly it's not you know, losing 50% of our computational capacity just to be sure, right? right? So I'm going to argue actually that, yeah, um, PFAIR scheduling is you know, interesting uh, and we should do it. Uh, you know, it, it is uh, much better than an approach uh, in which utilization is limited to try to make sure that we uh, succeed on all goals. So yeah, let's go with it. Anyway, that concludes our discussion uh, about real-time scheduling algorithms. Uh, and we'll continue by talking about sort of what other uh, commercial operating systems use uh, in the next topic.